strains of Joy to the World fade away, may I offer you a very, very blessed Christmas and an especially warm welcome to anybody who, today of all days, is having to cope with being alone. We do hope you can find somewhere quiet and peaceful for the next 20 minutes or so as we give thanks to God for all of his great love to us in the giving of his only begotten Son. But let's start by turning to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of Christmas, that you gave us your very best, that in the person of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the giving of the gifts that we give, we remember your great eternal gift. Lord, this Christmas is so different for so many of us. Lord, there is an ache in our hearts for those who we want to hold and love and yet cannot touch. And Lord, we think of all those who are battling to get home this Christmas, who have been blocked by circumstances, who are stuck in vehicles maybe on hard shoulders or lorry parks, unable to be with those who they love. Lord, we pray for the gift of endurance and the sustaining power of your Holy Spirit to see us through this time. And as this pestilence of Covid sweeps our nation apparently with new vigour, Lord, we ask for your mercy in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. The lectionary provides us with a psalm for Christmas Day, and it's Psalm 96. It's a psalm where we sing a new song to the Lord of all the earth. And Mike's going to lead us in this now. Please feel free to join in with the bold type, won't you? I'm going to read together Psalm 96. I'll lead with a light type if you'll join in with the bold. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered among all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honour and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, The Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar, and all that fills it. Let the field exult, and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness, and all the peoples with truth. Our Gospel reading today comes from the pen of St Luke. Luke's Gospel has a flavour all of its own, and he starts off by telling us that his initial purpose in writing his Gospel account was for one person, a person called Theophilus. We don't know anything about him, but what started off as an audience of one has become one of millions, including you and I. We think that Luke wrote his Gospel possibly at around about AD 60, when the events of Jesus' ministry, death and resurrection were still vivid in the minds of his contemporaries. Contemporaries. Luke has a forensic eye for detail, and amongst historians, he is viewed as being the most reliable writer of the ancient period. We know that Luke was by trade a physician, used to carefully weighing up information before making an accurate diagnosis. He accompanied the Apostle Paul in some of his journeys, and also wrote the Book of Acts, a history of the early church from Pentecost onwards. Many of the witnesses of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus were probably still alive, and it is quite likely that Luke was able to interview personally those who had first-hand experiences, those who were eyewitnesses of these events. The whole tenor of Luke's Gospel is one where he appears to be 
making a thorough investigation. He's after historical accuracy. He's after finding out the truth of what really happened. It's interesting to know that although Luke might have had access to Mark's Gospel and maybe even Matthew's, that at least 50% of Luke's material is unique to his Gospel. For example, the events surrounding the birth of John the Baptist to Zacharias and Elizabeth is found in no other Gospel. All this should remind us that one of the unique aspects of the Christian faith is that it is based on events that have taken place in space and time, historical events, not ultimately esoteric philosophies, but it's based in the birth, the life and the death of a person, that being God himself in the person of his son. So the gospel is not rooted in myth or legend, but in history itself. So at this unique point in the history of the world, God the Infinite One becomes finite. God the Eternal One enters time. God the Creator enters his creation. God the Omnipresent One becomes confined to the span of a human body. And God the Invisible One becomes visible. Yes, the coming of Christ is the coming of God himself. Emmanuel, God with us. Well, so to our reading. And it's from the second chapter of Luke's Gospel, verses 1 to 20. And Mike's going to lead us in that now. Our Gospel reading comes from the Gospel of St Luke. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 20, the birth of Jesus. In those days a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them at the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favours. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Luke starts off in true historian mode, and in the first seven verses of our reading, gives us a concise context for the events that took place in Bethlehem. He starts off with the wider political context of the decree given by Caesar Augustus, and focusing down to more local matters by telling us that Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and that the outworking of this decree for ordinary people was that they had to travel to the town of their family's birth, which for Joseph, of course, was Bethlehem. And he finishes this matter-of-fact opening by telling us of the difficult circumstances surrounding the birth of Jesus due to the lack of room in the inn, and that Mary's baby baby was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. So a seamless transition from the global political stage to the personal circumstances of an individual life. We then come to the wonderful account of the shepherds, and Luke gives more space to this account than to the actual birth of Jesus himself, although of course the two events are obviously related. Here an angel of the Lord publicly announces to the shepherds that there was good news, glad tidings of great joy. Not just for them, 
but for the people of the whole earth. It's worth reminding ourselves, of course, that good news is the basis of our word gospel. So Jesus is the gospel. He is God's good news for human beings. Well, what is this good news? And the angel says, to you is born this day a saviour, who is Christ the Lord, the Messiah. It's worth noting that the term saviour, of course, is enshrined within the name of Jesus himself. You remember that both Mary and Joseph were told to call the baby Jesus. And that literally comes from the Hebrew Yeshua, or as we would say, Joshua, meaning that God saves, for he will save his people from their sins. So God has sent us what we as human beings really need. He sent us a saviour. Obviously, Jesus was a terrific example of nobility and moral integrity. He was a great teacher. He was a great healer. He was an example of patience and kindness, mercy and tenderness. But those, although true, are not his prime mission. He has come to save the world from its sins. The Jewish people of the time knew all about the idea of God as being a saviour. The entire narrative of God's people is filled with the imagery of salvation. We can think of the children of Israel enslaved in Egypt and God sending them a saviour in the person of Moses to lead them out of bondage and on towards the promised land. So they were familiar with the concept of God saving them from difficult circumstances. But reading through the prophets, we find God diagnosing the problem of his people not being so much in their difficult circumstances, but in the problem of who they were in their hearts. They were suffering from heart sickness, deceitfulness of heart, that kept leading them astray from the law that God had given them. So the prophets start talking about the coming of one who wasn't going to so much as save them from their political circumstances, but was going to save them from the corruption in their own hearts, to transform them from the inside out rather than from just the outside, and that this process would restore the broken relationship between God and his people. And this process of God reconciling his people to himself would not only involve us being forgiven by God, but also changed, transformed by him, being given a new heart, a heart of flesh, a heart that desires to live in holiness and bring glory to God. So Jesus primarily is our saviour, our rescuer from sin. Not only does he save us from the penalty of sin by taking our place on the cross of Calvary, he also breaks the power of sin in our lives by this transformation by his spirit. And we know in the fullness of time, in the fullness of his kingdom, we will be separated from the very presence of sin. So here we have the three P's of our salvation. We're saved from the penalty, power and presence of sin. For the theologians amongst us, being saved from the penalty of sin is called justification. Being saved from the power of sin is the process of sanctification. And being saved from the very presence of sin is what is called glorification. That taking place at the second coming of Christ. So Luke presents to us the coming of Christ as the coming of God himself. And this being the greatest moment in the history of the entire world and that Jesus is the long-anticipated Messiah of the Jewish people. The Christmas story is so well known to us that we just tend to accept it, but at times it's worth stopping and, if you like, interrogating the story afresh, asking questions about the whys and wherefores of the account. Today's reading focuses very much on the testimony of the shepherds. And the obvious question to ask then is, well, why did God send his angel to announce the birth of the Saviour to people like shepherds? In Jewish society, the shepherds were seen as the lowest of the low. They were seen as Sabbath breakers because, of course, they tended the sheep on the Sabbath day. And some authorities suggest that the testimony of a shepherd was not acceptable in a Jewish court of law. So why did God choose them? We can imagine that if God had employed, for example, a media or PR consultant in the modern day, they would have suggested that they would have had possibly a, a news briefing for Caesar Augustus himself, or at least to send out the message to the movers and shakers of the day. But God seems to be doing exactly the opposite. And in doing so, he's entirely consistent with the way that he seems to work in the world. The Apostle Paul, when writing to the young Corinthian church, says the following. Consider your own core, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. 
Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And Jesus, echoing the words of the prophet Isaiah, reminds his hearers that he was sent to preach the good news to the poor, not the powerful, to those who were humble in heart, poor in spirit, rather than the self-confident and the proud. And God chooses a lowly girl from an insignificant town up north to be the mother of his only son. And Mary, in her wonderful hymn of praise, the Magnificat, speaks of the fact that God has exalted that which was lowly. Although shepherds had a very low social status at the time of Jesus' birth, it should be remembered that in Jewish history, some of the greatest characters started off as shepherds. We could think of Abraham himself. We could think of Moses looking after the sheep of his father-in-law Jethro when God calls him to liberate his people Israel. And of course, the shepherd boy David, who became the greatest king that Israel had ever known. And Jesus takes to himself the title of being the Good Shepherd, the one who lays down his life for his sheep. But I think there might be something deeper going on here as well. It should be remembered that Bethlehem was only six miles from Jerusalem, just south. So the shepherds were tending their sheep on the hills between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. Jerusalem, of course, was the site of the temple, Herod's temple, and that was a place where the temple sacrifices would take place. And this would be the prime market for the sheep and lambs from the flocks on the hills surrounding Jerusalem, especially at times such as the Feast of the Passover, where thousands of families would crowd into Jerusalem and that a lamb would form an integral part of the Passover meal. In Judaism at the time, sacrifices were an integral part of the everyday life of the community. They were the way that God had ordained through the Mosaic law for a person to deal with sin. It enshrined the principle of what we call substitutionary atonement. The innocent lamb was slain in your place so that you might go free. It's a recognition of the fact that the soul that sinned should die. It's a recognition of guilt, but it was also a recognition that another one, an innocent one, could take the place of the guilty one. The guilty one might go free. In the New Testament, the writer to the Hebrews who was obviously steeped in Jewish law, recognises that these rites and rituals in the Old Testament of sacrifice were shadows of a heavenly reality. And he tells us that, in fact, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins, that at their best they are just physical shadows of a divine reality yet to come. So there was one who was going to come who is going to be the ultimate sacrifice that would in fact take away our sins. During Advent, we spent some time looking at the ministry of John the Baptist, heralding the coming of the Messiah, preparing the people with a baptism of repentance and forgiveness. But we're also told that one day, while John was baptising, Jesus came to the banks of Jordan, and John spots him in the distance. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he cries out, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And what is happening here is that prophecy is unfolding before our very eyes. Over 700 years before, the prophet Isaiah had written about God's suffering servant, God who gives himself for us, using imagery like this, that he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. So here as the fulfilment of all Old Testament prophecy. The Lamb of God is born into the world with the mission of saving the world from its sins. The innocent, sinless one, giving his life willingly as a substitute so that the guilty might be forgiven and go free. So the shepherds link the Old Testament and the New. They were responsible for rearing the sheep who would be the shadows, the lambs and the sheep offered in Judaism as symbols of God's atoning work. And yet here they are, they've come to see the lamb, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, 
lying as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem, the old and the new, meeting at this point in time. The coming of the Christ child was the end of the shadow times. The reality of God was now present in his creation, ready to live, grow and die to save his people. And as we contemplate this Bethlehem scene, may we be lost in wonder, love and praise. And so to our prayers, Father, we who are guilty, come and behold he who is innocent. We who are impure, come and behold the purity of yourself. We who, according to the law, would be under the sentence of death, come to behold the fountain of all life. We who tend to esteem ourselves too highly, today bow our knee in humility before a manger that contains a baby, mean and lowly, yet Lord of all the earth. Father, we pray for the gift of wonder. Wonder about your love and holiness, that you should send your only Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, we pray that you might cause new life to spring within us, that we might receive your saving grace afresh today. What can I give him? Poor as I am, if I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I can, I give him. Give him my heart. And may the revelation of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus be yours today. May the grace of God with us be with you. May the spirit of he who died for you be in you and give you peace. Amen.